people for us today. Hi, my name's Olivia. Now would be a great time to turn on Rush TV. I'm going to read Colossians chapter 3. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you have died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken on your new self, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. What makes us human? Relationships? Pursuing happiness? Being your authentic self. Fighting for justice. Raising children. Leaving a legacy. everybody. No, that wasn't actually me. That was another beautifully bald head in our church, James Goff. But it's good to see, uh, it's good to see the bald men being used as models. Uh, some, of us, uh, some of us are just too beautiful to cover up with hair. What can I say? Now, there's a, sense of, um, there's a sense of anticipation in the air at the moment, isn't there? Everything's beginning to open up. We're starting to get more freedoms. I think it's something actually to do with spring as well. I went out for a ride this morning and I just thought it's so beautiful to be outside. I can't wait to see your faces again as we move towards gathering together. There's kind of a sense of excitement about maybe maybe next year things will be slightly different. Maybe next year things are going to be better. And a couple of years ago, I was reading a magazine in December when I came across one of those, you know, those New Year, New You kind of articles. Every year the magazines write these articles about how next year you are going to be a new and different and better person. And I was kind of struck by the headline on this one. It was you 2.0, 45 things to do, think, buy and throw away to make you a happier, healthier, more productive human being in 2018. And to be honest, my first reaction was just feeling a bit tired. I mean, 45 things, sheesh, I think I'd rather just be mediocre. But you know, what really struck me was how somehow we have all become our own lifelong project, haven't we? You can't just stay the person you are anymore. No, we're all on this quest to become the best version of ourselves that we can possibly be. So that whatever else happens in 2022, the one thing you can bank on is this. The 2021 version of you just won't cut it anymore. Now, 2022 requires a better version of you, the improved, updated, upgraded you 2.0. But of course, that's where things get tricky, isn't it? Because what does you 2.0 look like? I mean, how are you supposed to improve? Because it seems to me everyone's got their own criteria, right? 
So the magazine I was reading, it's kind of one of those fairly materialistic magazines. And so they said that the U 2.0 should be marked by having better stuff. So they said, for instance, that U 2.0 really needs to have your own home coffee bean roaster. Because buying pre-roasted beans, that's so 2020, isn't it? This little number you can see on the screen comes from Norway. And at only $7,500, I calculate it will pay for itself in only 62 years. What a bargain, right? But actually, maybe your U 2.0 isn't marked by better stuff. Maybe it's marked by achievement. Because that's often how we try to improve ourselves, isn't it? Uh, this year, I'm going to buy a house. Or this year, we're going to pay off the house. This year, I'm going to earn my degree. I'm going to get married. I'm going to get the promotion or a pay rise. The new me is going to be marked by the things that I achieve. Or maybe... The new me is going to be marked by my habits. The new me is going to be healthier. I'm finally going to start eating properly. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to read more. I'm going to become a better rounded human being. The U 2.0 is marked by better habits. Or maybe it's marked by my experiences. The new me is going to be a more well-rounded, well-traveled person. I'm going to try new things. I'm going to meet new people. I'm going to push myself out of my comfort zone. Or maybe for you, it's going to be all about your inner health. I'm going to, the new me is going to learn to be more forgiving of myself. The new me is going to be less anxious about life. I'm going to follow my heart. I'm going to be less concerned about other people's expectations and more concerned about following my dreams. You see, the, the path to you 2.0 is different for everybody. But the one thing we all have in common is this. We're evolving. We're changing. I'm improving. I am my own lifelong project to become the best version of myself that I can possibly be. It's almost as if I'm on a journey to becoming the real me, the authentic me. And once I've made all these changes and all these improvements, then I will be the real authentic me. So who is it for you? Who is the U 2.0 that you are trying to become? What's your U 2.0? Just think about it for a moment. Is it about achievement for you? Are there things that you really desperately want to achieve this coming year? or in the future? Is it about habits? You feel like you can't become the real you until you break out of these destructive habits. Is it experiences? Is it something different for you? What is the image of the real you that you have in your head? Well, look, this series is called Being Human. And it's all about what it means to be a human from God's point of view. And we actually, like the guy said earlier, we have some pretty big topics coming up. We're going to explore what it means to be human and sexual. We're going to explore what it means to be human and a child. We're going to look at our emotions. How are our emotions and our feelings part of being a human being? We're going to look at individualism versus relationship. We're going to look at our need for other people's approval. We're going to look at what it means to be a human being online. We're even going to look at the beginning and the end of life and how being a human affects all of those things. And they're massive topics, right? But we have to start with the most fundamental idea. The idea of being human in the image of God. Because the very first thing that's said about us in the Bible is that we are created in the image of God. They're the very first words that you hear about us in the Bible. And so if we're going to have any hope of getting any of those other things right, we have to start here. In a sense, today is probably going to be the most, I guess, theoretical talk. The, the others are going to be intensely practical, and I hope today will be practical as well. But today is the most fundamental talk. What does it mean to be a human in the image of God? And you can see on the passage on the screen that being in the image of God means in some way being like God. 
Let us make mankind or humanity in our image, in our likeness. So in some way, being humans means we are like God. When you look at human beings, you're meant to be able to see something of God in us. You're meant to be able to see an image of God, a reflection of God. A little bit like when you look at one of our coins and you see an image of the queen. So on one side of our coins, you, you have the image of an animal. You have the platypus or an echidna, and it's, it's a representative image. It's not of any one particular animal, so far as I can tell. But on the other side, you have an image of a person. You have the image of the queen. And over the years, hasn't the image of the queen on the coin changed a lot? I mean, when you think about it, that's, that's because the queen herself has changed a lot. She's gone from being this fresh-faced 27-year-old when she came to the throne to now being, well, to be honest, a pretty amazing-looking 95-year-old. God, I did think this week, it must be kind of depressing when you think about it to have every decade or so this reminder of just how much you've aged as they produce millions upon millions of coins, all of them with your new baggier, saggier image. It must be kind of depressing, mustn't it? And yet that's the point. The coin had to change. The image had to change because it's meant to reflect her reality. That's its purpose. And in fact, that's our purpose too. Our purpose is to reflect God. The reason you were put here on earth is to be a reflection of God. And you know, when you put it like that, it actually forces me to rethink my life a little bit. See, if I've been put here to reflect God Well, you know what that means? What that means is that the single most important thing about me isn't actually me at all. It's God. The single most important thing about you isn't actually anything to do with you at all. It's not your appearance. It's not your achievement. It's not your eye color. It's not your personality. None of those things are the most important thing about you. The most important thing about you is actually the God that you reflect. Could it be that we actually tragically spend our lives focused on the wrong I'm so focused on Greg 2.0, this image that I have in my head of the person I want to be and my possessions and my achievements and my habits and my self-esteem and my fitness and my family. Could it be that none of those things is anywhere near as important as I think they are? This whole you 2.0 focuses on the wrong person. I'm so focused on becoming the person in my head, but it's not who I'm meant to reflect. God is. You see, if I really want to know myself, if I really want to become self-aware and understand myself properly, I shouldn't be looking at me at all. I should be looking at the God that I reflect. I kind of wonder if maybe I just need to be a lot less interested in me and a lot more interested in God. I wonder if I need to spend a lot less time thinking about me and pondering me and setting goals for me and actually just spending a lot more time getting to know God. You know, one of my favourite sermons that I've ever come across was preached by a guy named Charles Spurgeon. It's just in the most extraordinary sermon. Listen to what he said. He said, The proper study of God's elect is God. The highest science, the loftiest speculation, the mightiest philosophy which can ever engage the attention of a child of God is the name, the nature, the person, the work, the doings and the existence of the great God he calls his Father. There is something exceedingly improving to the mind in the contemplation of the divinity. It's a subject so vast that all our thoughts are lost in its immensity, so deep that our pride is drowned in its infinity. Other subjects we can compass and grapple with. In them we feel a kind of self-content, 
and go on our way with the thought, Behold, I am wise. But when we come to this master science, finding that our plumb line cannot sound its depth and that our eagle eye cannot see its height, we turn away with the thought that vain man would be wise, but he is like a wild ass's colt. But while the subject humbles the mind, it also expands it. He who often thinks of God will have a larger mind than the man who simply plods around this narrow globe. The most excellent study for expanding the soul is the science of Christ and Him crucified and the knowledge of the Godhead in the glorious Trinity. Nothing will so enlarge the intellect, nothing so magnify the soul of man as a devout, earnest, continued investigation of the great subject of the deity. Go, plunge yourself into the Godhead's deepest sea. Be lost in His immensity. And you shall come forth as from a couch of rest, refreshed and invigorated. I know nothing which can so comfort the soul, so calm the swelling billows of sorrow and grief, so speak peace in the winds of trial, as the devout musing upon the subject of the Godhead. Isn't that extraordinary? You know what's amazing? He preached that as a 19-year-old in his third week on the job. Makes me feel, talk about you 2.0. I'm convinced that if we just focused more on God, if we really did spend our lives wanting to know him and digging into his word and praying for him and serving him and really seeking his will for us and doing it, I'm convinced that if we were more fascinated by God, we would lose interest in ourselves, in our me project. And we'd be far happier for it. Do you need to spend less time in introspection and what you want and what you want to do and who you want to be and more time reflecting and dwelling upon God because you are his image? And yet that raises the question of, well, what does it actually mean? to be in the image of God. How are we like God? How do we reflect God? And look, if you've been around for a while, this is something that you might actually already be familiar with. You probably know the big two, especially if you've been along to mid-year conferences and so on, but not everyone has. So I'm going to go through it quickly and just bear with me if you've heard all of this before. The two ways that Genesis immediately says that we are like God is in our rule and also in our relationships. So you can see the rule part straight away in Genesis 1.27. God says, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. You see, we're like God in that we rule just like he rules. That's why Adam names all the animals in Genesis chapter 2, because in chapter 1, God was naming everything there. Naming things is a sign of rule. But the second way that we're like God is in our capacity for relationships, being male and female. Because the next part of Genesis says, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. See, being male and female seems to be the second way that we're in the image of God. And immediately, if this idea is new to you, you might be thinking, well, how on earth can that be? How can being male and female make us God's image? Because, well, God's a father and God's a son. Those are both male things. Is it that the Holy Spirit is female or something? It's not that God has a female side. It's that Godness, God has oneness and difference as part of who he is. So when you think about it, there's one God, isn't there? There is only one God. The Bible keeps saying that again and again and again. There is only one God. And yet this God is three persons. He's Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And, and they're all different. So the Father is the Father, he's not the Son. The Son was the one who died on the cross, not the Father. The Father sent the Son and the Holy Spirit glorifies both of them. They're three different persons and yet they're not three different gods. 
their one God. You see how it is with God? There is God has oneness and difference. And we're like him because we have one humanity in two sexes. So Genesis 1, 27 says, God made mankind or humanity in his image. There's a oneness to all of humanity. I am human and so are you. That's what means that we're entirely equal, that all human beings are created equal because we're all created in the image of God and yet we're not all exactly the same. No, God also created male and female. We're two sexes. So do you see how it is that we're in God's image? We're like God because we rule and we're like God because we're relational. And like I say, you might actually be pretty familiar with this. But, you know, actually this week, I realised that I've never actually understood this idea very well at all. And in fact, for the last 20 something years, I've been doing a fairly poor job of teaching it. And so if you've been in our church for the last 20 years, so I was about that. But hopefully today I'll do a better job of explaining it. See, what I've realized is what's important about being in God's image is not that we rule and not that we relate. It's how we rule and how we relate that's so important, that we do those things like God does. Because when you think about it, lots of animals have a form of rule, don't they? The predators rule over the prey and lots of animals are male and female. And so it's not the rule in the relationship that's necessarily important. The key thing about human beings is that we do those things like God does them. You see, God doesn't just rule. God rules in perfect love. And God doesn't just relate. God relates in perfect love. This is actually hugely important. We are in the image of God because of how we do things, because we love, because of the kind of rulers and relators that we are. So how does God rule the animals in Genesis chapter 1? Well, he blesses them. And then he says, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas. Let the birds increase on the earth. You see, God's rule is marked by blessing. It's marked by the kindness and love. It's the kind of ruler that he is. And God's relationships are marked by that too, aren't they? So again, again, in the New Testament, love is how the Father and the Son relate to each other. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. The Father loves the Son and shows him everything he does. And Jesus loves his Father and does his commands. See, this is actually really important to get. God doesn't just rule and relate. He rules and relates in perfect love. And we are supposed to reflect him. We're supposed to be like him. We are meant to be in the image of God because we love. Because we're loving rulers. We're loving relators. We're meant to be good like God is good. We're meant to be kind like God is kind and pure like God is pure. We're meant to have his character. That's what it means to be in the image of God. That is when you you think about our idea of the whole U2.0 that we were starting with. I have this image in my head of the person I've been trying to come successful and fit and healthy and all those kinds of things. The image God has in his head for me is love, character, goodness, that I will relate to the world the way he does and that I'll relate to other people the way he does. That is, as you look at human beings as a species and as individuals, and when you look at the way we rule the world and the way we treat each other, you are meant to be able to say, I can see exactly the kind of God who created them. I can see that he's more than powerful. I can see that he's loving. Because I can see it in his image. That's what human beings are meant to be like. That's what it means to be in the image of God. And of course, that's a great tragedy, isn't it? 
because that's just about the last thing you'd say about us. When you look at us as a species and when you look at us as people, you couldn't say that we reflect God in the way we rule and relate, could you? We're not much like God at all. No, as rulers, we're greedy and we're careless. And as relators, we're selfish and we're cruel. We're not like God at all, are we? And that's because of Genesis chapter 3. Now, we won't go very far into it because of time, but in Genesis chapter 3, you see ruling and relating in love just go straight out the window, don't you? So Adam and Eve don't rule the creatures. They obey a creature, the serpent who leads them not to love God, but actually to rebel against him. And Adam and Eve, they don't work together in love. They don't work together at all. Eve is the one making all the decisions and Adam's just standing there silently. And then when it all goes pear-shaped, they all start blaming everybody else. Genesis 3 is beautifully written to show us the fracturing of humanity in God's image. We're meant to reflect God, but we don't. In fact, the the fracturing is so great that it's kind of led some people to say after the fall, outside of the garden, human beings aren't in God's image at all anymore. That we've lost God's image. We've lost that reflection. I don't think it's right. I can see where they're coming from, but I don't think it's right. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, God says, whoever sheds the blood of man... By man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. Now, God says that when we're outside the garden. So this image of God must still be there in some sense, mustn't it? James says, with the tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. And again, that's outside the garden. So it seems as though even outside the garden, we retain some likeness to God, We're like God in some way, but it's just a broken, twisted, distorted way. One great illustration I came across was we're like a a windscreen that's been shattered. The glass is still there. You can still sort of see through it. It's just that the image you get is all broken and distorted and warped and you can't see reality properly anymore. We are still like God. We do still rule the world, don't we? But only sort of. We die and we go back to the earth. And we do still relate by like, like God. We, we do still have male and female. It's just that our relationships are always breaking down. We can still love, but we keep screwing it up and, and calling unloving things loving. And we're like a cracked windscreen. One guy I read put it really poetically. He said, we must state both that after his revolt... Mankind remains mankind and also that mankind has radically changed, that he is but a grisly shadow of himself. Mankind remains the image of God, inviolable and responsible, but has become a contradictory image. One might say a caricature, a witness against himself. That's what we are now. We're a grisly shadow. We're a caricature of what, of what we're meant to be. You, you can see God in us, but only just. Which is why Jesus is such wonderful news. Of course we have to get to Jesus. The whole Bible is taking us towards Jesus. And I tell you what, Jesus just so beautifully and perfectly fulfills this whole idea of the image of God. Jesus does it in two ways. Firstly, Jesus is the true, perfect image of God. And secondly, Jesus is the one we are becoming like. So in Colossians chapter 1, Paul says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. You see, we were created in the image of God. Jesus is the image of God. When you look at Jesus, you don't just see a reflection of God. You're not just seeing someone who is like God. No, you're seeing God. Amazingly though, as a human, 
This is what's so extraordinary about Jesus when he becomes a human being. He is the perfect God. There's no filter there. There's no crack. He is God. When you look at him, you're seeing God in human flesh. Jesus is perfect God and humanity together. And in fact, when you look at Jesus' life, he really was the perfect image of God, wasn't he? I mean, Jesus ruled with tremendous power and also perfect love, right? So Jesus' life, in his his life, he showed he had power over creation and demons and sickness and death. Jesus was just awesome in his rule. And yet his rule was the most perfectly loving one, right? It was the one where he sacrificed himself for other people. It was the one where he had compassion on the lost crowds. Jesus wasn't just powerful. He was gentle. He was merciful. He was loving and he forgave. If we're a cracked, shattered image of God, Jesus is that perfect, clear screen. Better than that, Jesus is God in the flesh, the image of God. In fact, as we think about our whole Greg 2.0 thing, Jesus teaches us something about where God's attention really lies. God's great project for humanity was always about Jesus. Jesus is the perfect human being who reflects God and God's great project for humanity was always to glorify Jesus. It's kind of humbling, but God's actually much, much less interested in the Greg project than I am and much more interested in the Jesus project because Jesus is the human being that we're always heading towards. And in fact, what God wants for me is that I'm going to be captured up in Jesus' glory by becoming like Jesus in his image. So have a look at what Paul says in Colossians 3. He says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry, Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. And you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. You see, it turns out when you read the Bible, there is a you 2.0 that you're becoming. But it's not the ideal in your head. It's not about your achievements. It's not about your habits. It's not about how you feel about yourself. No, the ideal you 2.7 that you are becoming like is Jesus, if you're a Christian. So see verse 10 there. He says, you have a new self, which is being renewed in the image of its, renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator, which in verse 11 is Christ. If you're a Christian, God is on this lifelong project renewing you remaking you, remodeling you so that you will reflect Jesus. And when you look at it, it's, it's all about character, isn't it? So verse 8, rid yourself of anger and rage and malice and slander and filthy language from your lips. Don't lie to each other since you've taken off your old self. You see, it's all about having Jesus' character. Because remember way back in Genesis, that was how we are like God. Not just that we rule and relate, but that we rule like God rules in love. That we relate like God relates in love. And if you're a Christian, God's great project in you is to spend the rest of your life 
remodeling and remaking you in God's image. And you know, there's something kind of bittersweet about that. What's sweet about it is God is doing it and he's doing it by the Holy Spirit. What's challenging about it is that there can be a kind of tension between me and God. You see, in my head are all of these things that I hold really dear about the person that I want to be, things that I've been conditioned to and and things that I've grown up with and things that I've longed for for years and sometimes decades. And it turns out that God may actually care much less about those things than I do. And it might actually be that I need to spend decades learning to care less about those things and more about looking more like Jesus. In one or two ways, that's actually the story of my Christian life. There are one or two areas of my life and my identity that I have clung very dearly and tightly to a particular image of the kind of person that I wanted to be and over the last five years or so, God has been stripping those things away from me and challenging me and saying, Greg, these, are, these things are actually much less important and I'm going to withhold them from you because I have this better thing for you. And, you know, I think that's one of the harder things about the Christian life is learning to trust God, that his image for me is better than the one I came up with. And in fact, Paul says, commit to this. Notice the intentional language that Paul uses here in Colossians chapter 3. Rid yourself of those sins. Put those things to death. Take off the old self. Put on the new self. Paul calls us to engage in this and to embrace it. Make this your lifelong project to become like Jesus. To have his love and have his patience. Have his purity and his generosity and his forgiveness. Make becoming Jesus the great project of your life. In fact, just for a moment, ask yourself, what if when I get to the end of my life, when this whole me project comes to its end, what will I regret not becoming? Successful? Married? Owning a house? Will I, will I regret it if I never own a house or pay it off? Will I regret never getting control of my health, mental or physical? Will I regret never becoming the well-rounded, well-experienced, well-traveled person I'd like to be? See, loads of those things are really good things, aren't they? There's nothing wrong with some of them. Some of them are really good. And and in fact, some of them, I, I think I will be sad if I don't necessarily achieve them. But God created me to be a reflection of Jesus. That's the real me. That is, I am the most me. I am the most real me when I'm most like Jesus. Not when I get those things that I've decided I'd like to be in my head. I will become the most authentic version of me, the most ideal me, when I most reflect Jesus. So in fact, I don't want to be sidetracked by that image in my head anymore. I don't want to be distracted or duped into thinking that that's who I am. That's the real me. And giving my life over to pursuing those things. No, in fact, I want to sit loose to all of those things and maybe even reject them outright. It's okay if I never own a house. It's okay if I never get a degree. It's okay if I never travel. It's okay if I'm never well. It's okay if I never get a hold of my eating habits because those things are not what makes up the real me. Jesus is. And as long as I become more like him, I'm learning to be okay with missing out on those other things. 
What did you say in the beginning? When I ask that question, who is the real you that you are trying to become? What was your you 2.0? What was your answer? This week, why not try and carve out 15 minutes and sit down and write out a different list. Write out all the ways that you really wish you were more like Jesus. You might want to read it from, say, Colossians chapter 3 or maybe read a gospel like Mark and dwell on the character of Jesus there. What are all of the ways that you really wish you were more like Jesus? And then ask him to help you with it. And that'll be the journey to becoming the real you. Shall we pray about that? Let's pray. Our God, we praise you for the honour that on this earth we reflect you, we're like you, that we rule and relate in love. And we confess that that's what we haven't done. In the way we've ruled this world, we've been selfish and careless. And in our relationships, we've been cruel and indifferent and selfish. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he is the perfect image of you, perfect in rule and love and relationships. And we thank you that this one died and rose again in glory and that your great project is for his glory. And we thank you that we get to be part of it, that we get to be remade in his image. Please teach us to let go of the picture of ourselves that we have in our head, the us we would like to be, and to grab hold of the one that's like Jesus. We pray that as we struggle with this, as we live in this tension of choosing to let go some pretty cherished ideals for some of us, some fairly cherished pictures, we pray that we would trust you that the real us is not this person we've been trying to become, but Jesus. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit, that you are the one who is renewing us in knowledge in the image of our Creator. We thank you that we don't do this alone, but in the power of the Spirit in Christ. Amen.